Yeah, so. Okay. Um, great. You know, what inspired you to do the analysis that you did um, earlier on in the pandemic? When the pandemic, when the lockdown first came, and that came, if you remember, very quickly, I was sort of blown away. I just thought, given the obvious, enormous costs of shutting down life, I thought to myself, we must be facing, maybe I've misunderstood, we must be facing something that's three times worse than smallpox in the 17th century. I mean, I just I just thought I'd completely missed uh, the seriousness of the virus. And so almost immediately I started, you know, doing my own research on this sort of stuff. And uh, economists, many economists were on top of this thing right away. And uh, uh, most of the public health officers, I think, ignored the thou literally thousands of papers that were done by economists over the first 18 months. But so I was sort of reading that very quickly. And there was a group of economists in, in UCLA that by the end of the summer of 2020 had done such phenomenal work that really showed, uh, I thought, that the lockdowns were useless, uh, that the virus was moving through populations exactly the same way, regardless of what the, the, the culture, the civilization, the governments were doing. And when that, I thought, okay, well now it's over, right? There's no way we'll go back to lockdown in the fall. And of course we did. And so that just got me more interested reading up on all of these things. And then in the spring, I got involved in a lawsuit uh, over the lockdowns. That thing went nowhere, but I wrote a report that when the lawsuit went nowhere, I just for nothing better to do, I posted it on my Facebook I only have six friends on Facebook, but somebody shared it. I posted it on a Monday and by Thursday it went viral and it was sort of nonstop after that. Wow. Um, so this wasn't even when you first had your results, then they weren't in an academic journal. It was just some findings that you had done. Yeah. I just wrote up. All, I normally, when I do my, my, um, when I do my own little private things like this, I mostly write things up just so I remember them and I don't forget them. So I, I wrote them up and I sort of shared them on Facebook for the same reason. I thought maybe some of you would like to know what are the assumptions of these epidemiological models. And maybe some of you would like to know what the uh, what the best evidence on the effect is. And maybe some of you would like to know what are the costs and what are the benefits and you know what would be the ratio. I, I literally, my initial intention was nothing that short of that, but... It went viral. In the end, I had two journals ask me if I would, uh, you know, rework the material and make it publishable. And so I ended up publishing it. And through that, I got to know uh, people like Paul, uh, uh, the name just escapes me. But anyway, various people that uh, I ended up writing these two things for the Fraser Institute. Yeah. Do you think that there's been a strange sort of uh, aversion to the kind of analysis that you did, or is it that others have done it in various respects? Maybe not, you haven't, I mean, you pulled it all together from those various sources and then had it spit out the numbers. But do, do you think that uh, this is a thing where once they got out of the gate, they had to just keep doubling down and couldn't afford to look bad? Or why was this information? Well, it's funny. Important? So are, are you aware of the two papers that I wrote for Fraser and Suit or just the one? Uh, I'm aware of the one. Actually, I haven't read either on Fraser. I've read the original publication that you did. I also read the two recent articles that you posted. So if there's right. a second so, full paper on Right. So the second paper is my theory about what, you know, what happened. And yeah, it oh, is this double down go. idea. So I, here's my theory of what happened. Um, the world panicked. Let, let's not wonder about why the world panicked, but the world panicked, every government uh, panicked. And you had these models like the ICL model that for Canada was saying we were going to lose a, over a quarter of a million people in three months. That is like worse than smallpox in the 18th century. And so let's suppose that's the reason why they panicked. They saw these numbers and they thought we have to do some ridiculous thing. Even by March 20th of 2020, that's only a couple of weeks 
after the the pandemic has been declared. There's an article in the New York Times by an epidemiologist who has looked at the data. He's looked at the Princess Cruz data, which turned out to be a phenomenal data set uh, because it's it's there's no selection bias. Uh, he had looked at the South Korean numbers, which were also very good. He'd looked at the data from Italy and the data from, from the Netherlands. And he basically describes the basic characteristics of the of the virus. The, the infection fatality rate is nowhere near what we thought it was going to be. The reproduction number doesn't look anywhere near what we thought it was be in these models. And most importantly, the age, the steep age gradient of the of the fatality rate was obvious. So, you know, you're 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 a thousand times more likely to die from COVID if you're over 70 than if you're under 20. Uh, all these factors show up right away, but after lockdown, and here you are, you're a politician. By the end of April of 2020, you know, there had been a, a loss of wealth in the country by a third. The stock market value just crashed. You had destroyed a third of the wealth of the country. Oops. And you're going to admit that? Not a chance, right? Not a chance. What you're going to do is you're going to say, well, we thought it would be two weeks to bend the curve. It obviously wasn't. We're going to have to go for another two weeks and another two weeks. And you're just hoping and praying that this thing goes away and you can declare a victory. The summer comes, the virus fades away. If you remember, I mean, people started to act normal and lo and behold, the virus comes back again. You're a politician. What are you going to do? You have to repeat. You can't say, oh, it's September of 2020. We know we know the facts now. In September of 2020 now, those UCLA numbers are out. I mean, now we've got real incredible data showing that the virus, after it enters, after I think 25 people are killed, by COVID in a, in, a, in, a, in a jurisdiction, the virus behaved exactly the same way. So once it gets into the population, it took 30 days for the virus to settle down and have a zero growth rate in, in the mortality rates. But you can't admit that because that would mean that, you know, people would discover, well, you actually knew this back in March. And so you had to do it again. And then you had to do it again and you had to do it again. And just like in Blackjack, when you're engaged in a double down strategy, the stakes get higher and higher and higher because you're causing more and more damage. And there is no way you can let the truth out, right? Uh, because now you're responsible for six rounds of a lockdown. And eventually, you know what happened, right? I mean, Omicron came. Omicron wasn't death knocking at the door. Omicron entered the door and Omicron showed everybody that you know, what the real in infection mortality rate was. And it was nothing like what people had been scared to believe. And that kind of caused, you know, riots and the, 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 the trucking convoy. And that led to, you know, the Emergencies Act because that had to be shut down. And, but what did Omicron do? Omicron basically infected almost everybody and led to this endemic state and the government could very quickly declare a victory. And now it certainly doesn't want to go back and revisit anything or talk about it. No, no. I do want to explore this recap that we're having to do as a society and hopefully as governments and as citizens on this. But when you looked at those original numbers with we're saving this many years, but we're losing this many years, what were the assumptions there as to life years? For me or for what was? Uh, for the study that you did. So you said it was a, a very, you know, basically the cost benefit ratio was something like 3.6 to 240, um, you know. With yeah, about 141, I think. Okay. I know, uh, so in the, you're talking about the original study now, or are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, the original study. Yeah, the yeah. original one. So, I mean, so part of the problem in when you're trying to estimate what are the costs and benefits of lockdown, on the benefit side, you're trying to get a, you're trying to get a, at a number that says if we lock down, we'll save so many lives, lives or so many life years. Mm -hmm. um, that's what you're trying to get at. And so, using the studies I had at the time, I I, I used a number that I uh, came up with that. On the other hand, you, when you try to get at the cost, 
this is a real problem because it is going to take a generation to figure out what the actual costs are. And when I needed my initial study, we had some guesses at loss of GDP. We knew there were enormous costs in terms of educational opportunities for young people. We knew there was, you know, anxieties were creeping up. We knew there were deaths of despairs were creeping up, but nobody had actually measured any of that thing, let alone tried to figure out how to aggregate it. So I used a particular methodology um, that was sort of developed by a guy named Brian Kaplan at George Mason University, which is sort of asking you a question to get you to reveal uh, what would be how many years of your life or days of the week or months of the year, how much would you sacrifice to avoid having gone through the lockdown up to uh, the summer of 2021. So I, I use that kind of a methodology to get at that. In the update with uh, the Fraser Institute, I didn't bother uh, doing something like that. So, and well, in general, on the one hand, it it's clear now that the lockdowns had a much smaller effect than I even thought they had in 2021. I mean, really quite negligible. So in the United States, over the first two years of the pand pandemic, it looks like lockdowns saved about 6,000 lives a year. To put that into context for a country that has almost 340 million people, 72,000 people die every year in the United States from the flu. So 6,000 might sound like a big number, but it's really a, a tiny number. It's about 3% of those that died from COVID. So the benefits of lockdown are trivial. On the cost side, we still have not aggregated up all those costs, but what I did for the update was I just looked at what we call the collateral deaths, deaths that we think were caused because of lockdown. And there I use these numbers from this fellow at the University of Chicago looking at excess mortality. And it looks like there were about six times the number of deaths caused by lockdown that were compared to what was saved from lockdown. If you put it that way, sixfold, that's just one category of cost, right? Uh, not counting all the other things that happened. I just got an email this morning from a woman who was told me a tragic story of her brother-in-law who lost his job due to lockdown, uh, ended up drinking too much, ended up getting going into rehab, in and out of rehab, in and out of rehab. After at, in 21, he still did not have his job and ended up committing suicide. Now, you know, that death of despair kind of thing, enormously tragic, happened to all kinds of people. That's not counted in those collateral deaths. So anyway, uh, whatever the final total will be, it's going to be a disaster. I've heard that for every, what, 0 0.1 loss in GDP or in employment that you have a certain correlated number of deaths. Are you familiar with any of that kind of research? Sure. Yeah, speak to that. So you again, you can say, you look at, um, you know, when you lock down, you have people that are unemployed. Uh, unemployment, for every, every spell of unemployment, you know, economists have done a lot of work on how does that translate into lost life? When you're unemployed, your income goes down, your diet, quality of diet goes down, your your anxiety levels go up, your mental health goes down. All these things contribute to a shorter life. So we've got lots of estimates like that. And I believe in the United States, again, for the first year of the pandemic, the consequence in terms of deaths, lost life years, uh, due to just the unemployment part, is about 800,000 lives. If you convert the unemployment into lost lives and convert that to deaths, if I recall correctly, it's about 800,000. Mm -hmm. My impression is if you take any category of costs, um, each category of costs swamps the benefits of lockdown. So when you add up all the various category of costs, eventually when we do that, uh, it's again, going to be a disaster. So uh, some of the freedom groups, uh, I'm not, familiar with a lot of them, but uh, there's one in this city. Uh, they're telling me that a lot city of- City are you in? I'm in Regina. Okay. Yeah. I just came back from Saskatoon, was very disappointed at the temperature. Um, well, if you keep your expectations low enough, you'll never be disappointed, but it's definitely not Vancouver. 
Yeah. Well, no, it was only mine. It was like one plus one to minus five. I mean, oh, you on. wanted the the cold. I wanted the cold. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to go to a place. I want to experience what it's famous for. We want you to keep coming back, and I'm sure we will come through for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, they are telling me that the attendance is dropping. I mean, you used to have a whole lot of people who were concerned because they felt like there was a knife at their throat. There was a lot of misinformation or, or suppression of information. And now things are relatively back to normal. But why do you think we need to have an accounting of this uh, policy decision now that things are kind of back to what they were? Because we need a record for when it comes back to again, right? Uh, and that's the thing. It will come back in one way or another. It might be another virus. It might be who knows what other existential threat we face. But uh, we need a record. Even if it's just for history, for posterity, or for academics, uh, we need a record. But, of course, there will be a social good that comes from the record. And, um, and that's why I guess it is kind of important that the record is why there's multiple records for starters. Uh, and uh and why they're as uh, as truthful as possible yeah we've got a national citizens inquiry coming what sorts of things do you or areas do you hope that they explore so they're calling witnesses forward i mean there's so many aspects to this but what are some of the ones that really stick out to you yeah well i think it's this is the uh, you know Again, when the lockdown happened, people were only thinking of the cost of lockdown in terms of lost GDP. And certainly that's important. Uh, but my goodness, that's that's just the the you know the the starting of things. There has to be a full accounting of what you might even call the loss of livelihood or the loss of living. Maybe the loss of living is better. A full accounting of sort of, you know, what does it mean when people cannot have a funeral? to say goodbye to their loved ones, or they cannot have a marriage or a wedding to celebrate that big event on life. All these things, these getting togethers, the whole point of life is for the living. We lost that. It really was two years of lost living. Those sort of, often they're just stories and narratives, but they're real, right? And, and, and somehow really important, very difficult to put dollar values on, but that has to be the case. All of these, the, the, the deaths of despair, the overdoses, the, uh, you know, the suicides and all these sorts of things have to be accounted for. And there has to be kind of a narrative that goes along with that. Um, deaths caused by lost cancer appointments or other health appointments, those sorts of things. The complete failure of the healthcare system, uh, you know, has to be accounted for. You know, and just just keep going. Another one is, you know, we dumped so much of the costs on the very young, and there's been lots of research on that. So we can we can make a, a record of what happened there. Uh, you know, these are the very people that were going to experience the least consequences because of COVID, and uh, and yet they experienced, in a sense, a generational effect. You know, children that had they're only view of a human being was with a mask on and you know didn't get to read faces think about it you're 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 probably old enough you remember when Ceausescu and Romania kept those kids in those orphanages and they were isolated for you know a year and a half two years you know those those children had lifelong problems I have two friends that adopted children from Romania so those kids are now in their 40s and they have just had one issue after another because of the, the consequences. And we will probably find 20 years from now that those children that were born at the beginning of that pandemic are going to be facing uh, life lesson skills problems that, that uh, were a result of that. But not only that, just the educational loss and uh, uh, the anxiety that these people suffered, on and on and on. The, the Whatever inquiry there is needs to have as broad a, of an agenda as possible in terms of categorizing the various consequences of lockdown it went so much farther than just uh you know we didn't get as many uh cars built yeah Ceausescu was one of the first ones to fall when communism got unraveled over there so 
that's always a big part of the story when you're looking back on those years. I'm thinking part of the issue we're facing now is how much attention that this National Citizens Inquiry will or won't get. I think that brings us back to your experience with the non-media coverage. So you, you had such clear public interest that from a, tr a train of six people, you could have it basically completely blow up and yet the media completely ignores something that's of clear interest and right. relevance. Right. But why do you well, think that was? Well, I think in part, in part because the mainstream media was part of the message, right? Whether it was they were literally in bed with the state or not, they went along with the beginning. I mean, they they were part of that. Again, you are you're telling people certain things, and then you find out they're not true. You can either admit that you made a mistake, or you can just carry on with that narrative. I think, you know, I don't. I personally don't believe in big conspiracies. I just think it was in every person's interest who declared that we, you know we have to lock down, we have to do that. It was in it was in their interest to carry on. Now. I was always struck too, and, and I've talked to various media people um, about how little they actually knew about the virus because most of the information they got, they just got from the daily press conferences. They never bothered to to look at uh, the actual data. So even something like, you know, there's a uh, a website called Our World in Data. It's put out of the University of Maryland, and it was a phenomenal resource for information on the virus. You could look up deaths, cases, vaccination rates, what variant was common at the moment, number of patients in ICU for any country uh, on any, you know, several different margins by week, by year, cumulative, whatever. I was always struck by how many people never knew that that existed, um, which, you know, academics were looking at that, you know, literally every day, keeping track of things. But um, so part of it was, vested interest part of it was maybe ignorance and uh i don't know did you get any professional blowback you know um <laughs> only indirectly okay. it was really not that bad um i got and for the the little bit of blowback i got it was completely swamped by one the response by the public uh I, literally, I was overwhelmed. I mean, there were days when I'd have 50 emails uh, in my mailbox from people telling me their story or or whatever. But also, I, of those 50 emails, probably 10 a day would come from other professionals from all different fields uh, who had been doing their own research, doing this, that, and the other thing. And uh, And again, even this morning, I got an email from somebody and he'd been doing work on the problem of ventilation in high rises that you know you were locking people down and some people lived in older towers where the windows didn't open and the the air is being just recirculated and so you're getting the 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 you know the virus was aerosol you're getting it from maybe 400 people the air is floating through your thing you know uh so there's a guy doing a research on something that i would have no opportunity to know about but you know he reached out to me so um, for the little bit of blowback I got, uh, it was much, you know, offset, you know, many ways I ended up being part, there was a group of theologians of all things at Regent college in Vancouver. They contacted me and we ended up doing a, a podcast series. I was only involved in a couple of them because they wanted to go off on their theological things, but they're still going. I got involved in a, in a, a, a book club with a group of high school science teachers that, you know they wanted to come me come and have me talk about covid i came and i enjoyed them so much i've ended up in this book club with them so there have been so many side benefits that way that have been very positive wow now we're in a different stage and there isn't as much of a sense of well if we cover this then the public will do that we don't want to encourage vaccine hesitancy we don't want to blah blah, blah. anything that we could imagine is in their heads um, but the issue isn't as pressing. So do you think that we still have this window now where we're going to get an honest take where a national citizens inquiry will get coverage because there isn't that, um, again, I'm not so concerned about the coverage because, you know, 
for so many people, it's such a bad memory. That, and I totally understand why they want to move on. I had a friend who went through a real serious cancer bout and uh, lasted for about nine months. And during those nine months, she was blogging about it, writing about it. And then she went into remission and she'd been in remission in a long time. And she never can talk about that time. It was such a dark, terrible time in her life. She doesn't want to, even though it was that all consuming at the time. And I think COVID is a little bit like that. It was all consuming at the time. And now it is just a dark hole in your life and you don't want to go back there. So I can completely understand why people may not want to be interested in talking about it, et cetera. That's not the point of any inquiry. The point of an inquiry is to make a historical record so that if we're ever under this threat again, we have something that we can point back to, some place where things have been collected, archived, documented, and that you have some kind of a trust about them. That's why I think multiple inquiries are not a bad idea. Um, they'll they'll compete with one another. And I think competition tends to bring out the truth. So that's the real reason why this has to be done. Well, fair enough. In, including, I am not even that concerned about, you know, we're going to have an inquiry to hold these people to account. Yeah, I don't know about that. Uh, you know, that as soon as there's some kind of a political agenda like that, that can also get in the way of the truth, right? right. So for me, the big thing is that we need a singular historical record that would be well, at least known, maybe not well known, and have easy access to, written for a general population too. Right, yes. Well, it does seem with Brian Peckford's departure that there's an intentional sort of evening of the treatment that they want to give. They want to allow both sides to speak. If yep. we can characterize it as being polarized, basically, uh, if you could divide them saying that the side that responded the way that they did uh, was justified in doing so, and then others that are saying that it isn't. Although that whole aspect, again, as you've discussed, is only one small part of all, all of what this was. Yeah. So uh, we'll see what comes of it. Uh, do you intend you know, to- There's no such about? thing as an unbiased inquiry. It doesn't matter, right? There's no such thing which is why it's probably good to have a government do one, a citizens group do one, maybe a provincial one, a federal, oh, it won't matter. The more, the better. Mm -hmm. um, and you can, con you know, it, there's certain things that are very difficult to hedge on, right? I mean, so people people could write things up, but there, there were facts. <laughs> there are lots of facts on the ground now that, that you know, if one group presents them incorrectly, the other group at least can 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 challenge that. It's like a courtroom. A courtroom relies on the defense and the prosecution to arrive at the truth. And, you know, maybe an inquiry should be like that, too. There, there'd be multiple of them that you can have a uh, have a go at. So Brian Fe Peckford stepped down because he thought he would, had a conflict of interest. Totally fine. He had that's that's his choice. I would not have been too concerned if he had stayed. Likewise with Preston Manning, um, I think Preston Manning uh, has enough stature and credibility that the fact that he's doing an inquiry for the province of Alberta, uh, that there's no serious conflict of interest. Um, again, uh, you know, you're never gonna have an inquiry that that is free of bias. I mean, that's impossible, but. Myself, I've been asked twice by different people if I would uh, volunteer as a commissioner on the NCI. I've said no both times because I think, again, I would come across as someone of bias, right? I was I'm very much opposed to what happened. Uh, we haven't even talked about their infringements on civil liberties. I mean, feel free to explore that. Well, I mean, you know, our civil liberties are not Trump rights. You know, we do not have trump freedoms i am not free to do whatever i want and but we have a constitution and a charter of rights that lays out uh, when those rights can be infringed upon and my own personal opinion is that threshold was not met uh, and certainly the threshold for the emergencies act was not met but that's another thing area that uh, an inquiry has to be done on and uh, fine, let the federal government have an inquiry into that. But uh, I think it'd be very important for other groups, either provincial or citizens, uh, to uh, do the same thing. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, I'm certainly willing to be a witness for the NCI or for any other inquiry that uh, uh, comes along. Is there a particular interest with regards to the pandemic that you're researching now in terms of getting some data, uh, exploring, or are you just moving to other things now? I, I'm, I'm moving on. <laughs> like I say, I, I was sort of accidental to come in on this. And my only role here really is I, I've not done any original research. I was just thinking I can, you know, I have some training. I have some mathematical background. I can understand these models and I can... I can articulate the issues in these models to a way that people without that training can understand. I have a lot of statistical training, so I can understand what a causal test is or difference in difference test is. And so I can explain that in a way. And I'm an economist, so I have an appreciation of what costs are and what benefits are. I just thought I was in a particular position to, to write things up in a way that average people could understand and synthesize those things and i guess i was right because you know i you know i think that paper that i published last year i think it said over seventy thousand downloads at the journal which is a uh, like a world record for that journal so, but yeah i have i i my research interests are elsewhere <laughs> sure hey is there any other aspect of all of this that we haven't explored that you'd like to take a crack at or make a foray into before we wrap up uh, I, don't, I don't think so. Nothing no, we've talked on. quite a while. Well, thank you so much, <laughs> Professor Allen. I really appreciate you, the work that you've done and also making yourself available for this. So uh, who knows, we could have opportunity again. Yeah. Okay, no problem. All thank right. you. Thank you so much. Have we talked before? Because you look familiar. Um, well, um, I, I don't remember talking to you in person. So uh, I guess I just have one of those faces. Okay. I, I mean, the Epoch Times, good for them. I mean, they've been one of the papers that's been... Them and the Desert News or the Desert News. I can't remember what it's called. They've been pretty good. Um, but yeah, I like this podcast format. I mean, this isn't a podcast, but uh, it allows you to go into some depth. I, that was another weird thing that came out of all this. I, I think I did 12 podcasts from all over the world. I mean, Germany, Australia, I don't know, England, everywhere. But uh, I, 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 I like that format better than, say, a radio interview where you've got three minutes and uh you know. well, i used to be in broadcast journalism and it was so formulaic boy yeah. you, you would hardly get someone talking more than nine seconds straight yeah. so it's just the shallowest exploration i think that's one of the great parts about the internet it's too bad i think that some of the censorship and suppression of certain views is out there because th this was our best chance of really exploring things in a certain depth so i think when you get it prescribed uh, it's problematic, but I probably don't need to convince you of that. So, yeah. 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 I had a radio interview yesterday and this guy had interviewed me last year too, but both times the same thing happened. He said, we'll have a 15 minute interview, but I, I think eight minutes was commercials. <laughs> so it was, it was sort yeah, of, yeah. Uh, give you your statement and then, uh, okay, go to commercial, come back. Uh, one more comment, commercial, and then a goodbye. <laughs> Yeah, well, for them, it's 15 minutes on the clock. And, yeah, 15 minutes on the clock, and you're right. You got traffic in between, and yeah, it doesn't, I don't know. It is what it is, but anyway. All right, nice chatting with you there, Lee. Well, the pleasure was mine. We'll do it again sometime. All right. Thank you.